BuildX Alberta 2024 is coming to the new BMO Centre at Stampede Park in Calgary, Alberta. Celebrate BuildX's 25th anniversary in Alberta on October 23rd and 24th with the biggest conference in the province covering architecture, engineering, interior design, home building, and renovation and property management. Check out the speakers, education sessions, and a trade show floor featuring a workforce solutions centre and a smart sustainable tech showcase. To register, go to informaconnect.com slash buildx-alberta and click register now. Hello and welcome to the Construction Record Podcast. I'm Digital Media Editor Warren Fry, and with me today I have Richard Florida. Uh, and Richard, uh, you've written a report uh, about Toronto's waterfront. Um, so maybe you could tell me what the report's about in the first place, and then I'd kind of like to go back to the history of the waterfront, which is in the report, explaining the sort of stumbles along the way to what you're recommending now. Well, you know, um, I don't know if it was a year or so ago, maybe 18 months ago, um, I was actually not in Toronto. I was sitting in Miami Beach and mm -hmm. reading kind of a lot of, I hate to call it negative. I, I, it's it's it, it coverage that was not exciting me about the waterfront. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of a lot of coverage, especially among urbanists, we don't need to do any big thing. We should make it all a public park. It's wonderful the way it was, the way it is. Um, we we don't really need new attractions. And in some of that, there was a lot of name calling. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, you know, it was a kind of ugly debate. Um, and there was a moment in the debate, there were these two architects that were de designing the waterfront uh, destination. And and people started really calling them names. And I, I know these two architects at Diamond Schmidt, and they're really, really good people, and they care mm -hmm. deeply about the city. And it was at that moment I said, you know, I should probably weigh in. So I decided to undertake to write a report. The folks at Therma Canada were generous enough to support me in writing my own report with no restrictions, no qualifications. Mm -hmm. And it very generously said, why don't you take six months to a year? And to be honest, I had to really learn this stuff. I, Some people might find that surprising um, in that I'm an urbanist, but mm -hmm. I had never really focused on waterfronts per se. You know, my, 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 Pack has been cities, metropolitan areas. And during the pandemic, I learned a ton about downtowns as they mm -hmm. went through this, you know, mm -hmm. shock of first being shut down and then being uh, slow to recover because of remote work. But I, I never focused on waterfronts. And I did, you know, a pretty intensive study of the evolution and role of waterfronts in, in cities in general and then in significant global cities, and it was really, it was a fantastic learning experience for me, and I hope mm. I hope people enjoy the report. Uh, and uh, you look in the report as to, well, you talk about other cities like London, Dubai, uh, world-class cities to begin with, which Toronto is too, um, but, but you said in comparison, the waterfront of Toronto just doesn't measure up. No, I mean, it, it, so, so t I want to make two broad points. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one is waterfronts developed as really trade and industrial zones. And, you know, if you go back and read Adam Smith ages and ages ago, he talked about the role of the waterfronts in making great productive industrial cities. And I, I guess, you know, when I grew up in New Jersey, the river in my hometown, North Arlington, New Jersey, the Passaic River used to go on fire and there were mm -hmm. fire boats to put out the river. Yeah. Yeah. So they were dump industrial areas, areas to move things and dumping grounds, it, it pretty much what the Toronto waterfront was originally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as cities um, became more post-industrial, as they deindustrialized, as manufacturing moved away, the waterfronts kind of lay fallow. And I guess that's why I didn't pay much attention. Mm -hmm. But what happened, of course, in many of the cities that I talk about in the report, London and New York and Chicago and Sydney and Copenhagen, you can go Singapore, those waterfronts were transformed into both places to live and work. Of course, there were office mm -hmm. buildings and wonderful housing, but incredible attractions, museums, cultural institutions, waterfront destinations. And when I looked, you know, I guess I had seen these things like any tourist, you would walk by the London waterfront, 
mm -hmm. gone to the Chicago waterfront. You know, I'm from New Jersey. I was a prof visiting professor at NYU. I know New York City inside out, and I, I didn't really pay attention. Mm -hmm. And what had happened is not only were the waterfronts remade, but they became part of a new and expanded downtown that instead of being a separate industrial area for mm -hmm. work and factories and boats, you know, and shipping stuff, dirty, grungy, you know, bounded by train tracks and separated by highways from the city, they had kind of morphed together and that a lot of the exciting business activity, a lot of the exciting tourism, a lot of the reinvigoration of the city and its downtown was in the, you know, the cool high tech companies were moving mm -hmm. to the waterfront, mm -hmm. the new kind of entertainment activity, stadiums, museums. And I was like, oh, wow. And, you know, I began to meet with people in Toronto um, who were and, and I learned a ton and they've done a great job. The folks at Waterfront Toronto, folks have to remember, you know, it took a long time to get our waterfront ready to develop. They had to spend mm -hmm. over a billion dollars to reroute the river and, you know, make sure it didn't flood. But Waterfront Toronto had been collecting data, and that's one of the data points I used. They had actually gone out and benchmarked Toronto against 10 waterfronts of comparable cities. So they left London and New York out, but they put in mm -hmm. Chicago and San Francisco and Singapore and Copenhagen and Sydney and Amsterdam. And they benchmarked them on some 40 plus indicators. You know, do you have iconic architecture? Do you have great public art? Do you have like great waterfront uses? Can you swim? Is there a marina? Is there restaurants? Is there nightlife? Mm -hmm. Toronto came in dead last mm, okay. by a huge margin. It wasn't even close. You know, the top scoring cities, say on 42 indicators, scored in the high 30s. Most scored no lower than 25. I think Toronto, I'd have to go to the report, but I think Toronto scored a grand total of nine, mm -hmm. putting it in a uniquely lowly category. Um, and, and you know, my my assessment was the same. We we haven't done much. And look, if you talk to any Torontonian, they'll tell you, yeah, there's not much to do on our waterfront. So, mm -hmm. so the report went through that and went through the history and then sort of suggests that it's, in many ways, I don't want to say this is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing be because now we have the time to do it right. Mm -hmm. And now we understand what the post COVID remote work, flexible work, you know, no longer going to downtown everyday city looks like. Mm -hmm. So we have an, and we have a lot of land to develop, particularly to our West and, and our East. So we have the opportunity to make a pretty spectacular waterfront. And, you know, my, my own sense is at least I provide an outline and we should do it. What, what do you think are, because uh, they've tried before, not quite at the scale you're talking about, but they have done some development, including the office buildings. And now even with Ontario Place, that's kind of another attempt to do so. So what do you think of the things holding it back from doing it that the other cities have just done other than just natural? Well, I mean, I mean, look, in, in the year 2000, I believe, and I go through this history, when I was writing the report, I'm like, one moment, I was like, I read this report from 2000 that outlined everything. We need to reroute the river. We need to you know, get ourselves ready. We need to develop a major entertainment district. We need to have an innovation center with high tech companies. We need to have private funding and attract foreign capital. I'm like, why am I rewriting something that was written in the year 2000? Fair. Okay. It's not like we didn't know this. I think a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One, it took a long time to, to do the, the construction work, to, mm -hmm. to do the infrastructural work, to get the place ready for development. Two, I think we have a lot of people that are opposed to development that Lake Toronto the way it was. And, you know, you see this. We don't need an island airport. Yes, mm -hmm. we do need an island airport. The more connected a global city is, we don't need any more destinations at Ontario Place. We should turn that into a park. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this, this kind of old school, small bore urbanism that says, you know, Toronto is a great city of neighborhoods. That's what we should do. We should all just go to the park and sit and look at the water. And that's, and we need more mixed, and all of that's great. I mean, Mm -hmm. My favorite places in Toronto are the ravines where I walk mm -hmm. every day and Tommy Thompson Park, where I ride my bike when I can get there mm -hmm. through all the construction that's going on. So I understand that. But but what I've learned is we also and and the other thing is, I don't think we. I don't I don't want to say we don't have a high opinion of ourselves. Mm -hmm. well, We're that's not very Canadian. I can thinkers. vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I talk about this in the report. There are great cities to live and work. Mm -hmm. I, I think Toronto is one of the greatest. I mean, we're choosing to raise our kids here. Mm -hmm. We get to walk in the school in our neighborhood every morning. We live in a safe neighborhood in a wonderful house on a ravine. And then there are cities of fun. And what's happened, of course, is those cities of fun, New York and London, but also Miami and Las Vegas and, and mm -hmm. Dubai, which, mm -hmm. which figures heavily in my, my thinking, 
you know, they become more attractive to business. This is the places business wants to go. And cities are not so much anymore about just living and working. I, I talk about this, you know, with colleagues at the Boston Consultant Group. I wrote this big new study published it in the Harvard Business Review. I said the old city where you lived and worked every day has changed mm -hmm. into a new city where, of course, you live and work. But that city is part of not only a physical cluster of commuters, it's mm -hmm. digitally connected to other cities. And the cities that are really, really doing well are the ones that are a great place to live and work and a great place to connect and have fun. We've kind of lagged on the fun factor and we've got to up our game. These other cities, you know, the one that struck me was, you know, New York and London came out first in our ranking. But Dubai, you know, and, and Singapore were in the next cluster along with Paris and Berlin and a few others. We weren't there. We were in a, a lower category with 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 cities that are falling behind. So I think we need to not only have more things to do for our residents, but a big part of what I think the report is talking about, we need to have more things to do on our waterfront for business tourists. And, mm -hmm. and the, you know, especially when people aren't going to the work, work every day and our downtown office buildings aren't full. We need things. I call it the transformation from a central business district to a central connectivity district. We need to be more about that. You know, since I've written the report, I've been talking to the Hotel Association and folks who work in hospitality and folks who book conventions. We're lagging on all of that stuff. You know, we need to up our game not only for, for local tourists and international tourists, which are all down, but if we want to be a global city, we got to be a city of connection and we got to bring in people here from, and that's mm -hmm. where the waterfront can play a role in being an exciting place for conventions and business events and business tourism. So what are some things, I mean, obviously hotels and convention centers connected to those hotels would be one of them, but what are some other things that aren't on the waterfront now that could be, that would sort of create well, this? And I don't want to, you know, I'm a, I'm an urbanist, I'm an analyst, I'm mm -hmm. looking at a very big picture, but if, if I had to paint that picture, here's what I would say. We need to make Island Airport the best it can be. That mm -hmm. Billy Bishop Island Airport is a unique advantage for Toronto in that it gives us a place that is connected, not just to other Canadian cities, but to New York, Chicago, mm -hmm. Boston, Washington, right on our waterfront, right into our downtown. And when people come there for TIFF or for a convention or for a business event, they're blown away. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I argue that that should be an example of a walkable neighborhood urban airport. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the bit the better that gets, and the more you know quiet jet flights or quiet plane flights it has, the better. The second thing is we need to add attractions. Now, of course, we need more housing, and there's lots and more parks, and there's tr and that should all be done well in the public realm, and the landscape should be spectacular. But we need more attractions. You know, mm -hmm. when I think about that, other cities have put their museums and cultural centers down on the waterfront. You know, I, 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 the AGO and the ROM mm -hmm. are in great urban neighborhoods, but maybe those neighborhoods should be the places we put the housing and the mixed use work activity They're mm -hmm. better collected by transit. Maybe over time we should think about beginning to think about relocating as we develop and adding any new cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. um, it's often argued that we don't have the kind of areas that high tech companies need to develop. This is why I was a big fan of Sidewalk Labs. I was going to ask about that next. To yeah. set up an innovation cluster, parts of the Eastern Waterfront and the Portlands with the entertainment areas and the film mm. studios. Digital entertainment should be that. I think sports, you know, on the it's very interesting. On the Western Waterfront right now, we have an incredible cluster of sports activities. You know, we have a couple of stadiums and facilities there. We we have Canadian football. We have WNBA. We have other activities. We have music and entertainment. We need to be doing more of that, making that, I think, the waterfront destination. Um, the Thermae thing is a great addition. It will be a place that draws in families. The other thing, our convention center is tired. It, mm -hmm. In the future, what if we had a convention center state-of-the-art on Exhibition Place, connected to what's happening at Ontario Place, where people could walk to that entertainment cluster. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, we we need to think about our stadiums. You know, they're also, Rogers Arena, Scotia, they're wonderful, but they're also in neighborhoods that are better served by housing. And off. what if in the future, you know, and mm -hmm. especially if we ever wanted to attract an NFL team, which I think we will, 
that kind of stuff. So you could begin to dream, you know, over 20 or 30 years of a very different kind of waterfront. Mm -hmm. Great parks, great amenities, great passive uses, great landscape, great trails, but also signature events and amenities connected by an incredible airport. You know, that's pretty Toronto to me, you know, mm -hmm. and instead mm -hmm. of just a park with some housing, a dynamic mixture. And then also, I mean, I don't, you know, when you go to Sydney, what do you see on the waterfront? You not only see an opera house, mm -hmm. you know, with people going to dinner, but you see all of these industrial, you see boats and barges. You know, that's what's neat about our waterfront. It, we, we now have the ability with with new kinds of mobility and new kinds of transportation and electric engines and uh, it, it, you can make things quiet. You know, the other day I, I flew in to Billy Bishop from Chicago mm -hmm. and the tunnel wasn't working. So they put us on the ferry. It's spectacular. I, I mm -hmm. mean, it, that's what Toronto is. So I think. We need to do that and not do it in a way that sells our soul, do it in a way. And, and the other thing, I just, why are we so uh, darn scared or against foreign investment in our city? You know, whether that's sidewalk labs or thermo, why do we get our, so many people, not everyone, get their backs up against the wall? Great global cities attract global investment. If we're going to be mm -hmm. a great global city, we better attract global investment. I'm worried that we're, you know, we're developing a reputation of chasing foreign capital out of town. And that's a big mistake. Now, you mentioned Sidewalk Labs. I remember going to, like, I'm in Vancouver where I would go to Toronto for conferences, and Sidewalk Labs was a going concern at the time, uh, and, and but then it didn't happen. So what are the lessons learned by it not happening, or the things you could take from uh, what, you know, in some ways is a great idea, and then adapt to this? Well, the first thing that needs to be said is, you know, Dan Doktoroff, who's an old friend of mine, mm -hmm. it was pilloried locally as someone who didn't understand, didn't know what to do, didn't get Toronto. I mean, you look at New York City, arguably the greatest city in the world. There no is argument. no one, not even Mike Bloomberg, credited mm -hmm. more with building modern day New York mm -hmm. as a more sensitive, urbanistic version of Robert Moses than Dan Doctorow. How does this happen? Mm -hmm. How does the same person who, who, is, who is lauded in New York City as a sit, true city builder who pulled New York City up by its bootstraps, served as deputy mayor, mm -hmm. seen as someone who didn't get Toronto. Th that tells me something. Mm -hmm. The second thing is what was interesting about Sidewalk Labs is that what it was an attempt, and what attracted me to it, was that it was an attempt to say to Toronto, we can build a new kind of high-tech cluster here. We need to build more high-tech industries here. We're, we're good at some things. We're not good at a lot of things. But in city building, urbanism, mobility, transportation, new forms of housing construction, new ways of building communities, we could not create a, not only build that neighborhood, killed a cluster of the world's leading firms anchored by Google. Mm -hmm. You know, now that's happening in the Bay Area. Now Google's doing that same thing in the Bay Area, out in, in San mm -hmm. Jose with a new neighborhood development, not here. Uh, I think what happened was we just dug our heels in and did our typical oppositional thing and finally wore them out. And they got just tired of fighting us. So I think what we, we should learn is we should be a little bit more open minded. Of course, we want to stand our ground. Of course, mm -hmm. we want to say, you know, you want to do things in an inclusive fashion. You want to do things that make Toronto better. We don't just want to turn over the keys to the city. And we have a very good example of that. When we went after Amazon's HQ2, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that bid that we developed said to Amazon, if you want to come to Toronto, you have to be a partner and you have to help us, you know, you have to help us build more housing and more transportation. We're not just going to hand you a bunch of money and keys to the city. Mm -hmm. We know how to do it. But yeah, I think the lesson is, we have to become more of a partner and less oppositional. Uh, and and hopefully, I think now, I, I sense that we've turned a corner. Maybe, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm overly optimistic. But I think we're finally breaking. I, you know, it's, it's not just Toronto. You see it. Nimbyism, not in my backyard. Oppositional mm -hmm. urbanism is not in fashion anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, now people are saying, no, we don't want to develop parking lots and pave paradise, but we, we want to develop and we want to develop attractions that fit into an urbanistic environment. And, and I think what we are learning to do because of changes in technology, new kinds of uh, uh, the, all sorts of changes in technology and transportation, that we can build attractions that are no longer noisy and noxious you know, stadiums ringed with parking lots. Mm -hmm. we, we can build stuff that actually puts major attractions in the middle of a city and major transportation centers in the middle of a city. And it works part as an urban neighborhood. 
I think Toronto could help show the world how to do that. And we have the, we have the template, you know, we have the space to do it on our waterfront. Uh, so finally, if people want to read this report, I think it's, it's free to look at. So where would people go to check it out and then just learn well, about this? I mean, the easiest way to do it is, is just Google it. Great waterfront, great city by me, Richard mm -hmm. Florida, or come to my website where it's published at creativeclass.com. Um, you know, and 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 take a look at it. There's also a pretty nice opinion piece. If you want the short version, mm -hmm. just go to the Globe and Mail. Joe Joe Barrage, a really fantastic urbanist, and I uh, put our minds together and wrote a very short piece. You know, 650, 750 words mm -hmm. on the future of Toronto's waterfront. So that's another the short course version you could look at. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us today, Richard. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being with you. Thanks for listening to the Construction Record Podcast. You can hear us on Apple Music, Amazon, and Spotify, as well as at theconstructionrecord.libsyn.com and on the daily commercial news and journal commerce websites. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>